If you've been watching my channel, then you know that I've been installing a three-way front stage in my pickup truck. I got everything in and I fired it up to see how it sound and it sounded like crap. Oh man, we've got some more work to do. Stay tuned for the adventure. In this video, I'm going to show you how to set up the Dayton Audio DSP and then show you how I used it and some other tools to track down some bugs in the system. So we're going to just go right ahead and pull up a screenshot of the DSP software right here, right now, and we're going to get rolling. So I fired up the mobile app and I'm connecting the DSP. You've got to make sure the Bluetooth is connected first and then you hit this red button at the top and the app will scan for your device. You select it from the menu and it takes a few seconds to scan and connect and load all the settings stored in the DSP. Once you're connected, that red button is going to turn green and then you can hit that button if you want to disconnect. At the bottom of the home screen, tap advanced settings. That's going to take us to the crossover screen. Look down at the bottom and select mixer. This screen will allow us to assign our four inputs to the eight outputs. It also allows us to name the eight output channels. So channel one is going to go to my left tweeter. Channel 2 is going to be the right tweeter. I select channel 2, then set input 2 to 100. Then you just repeat this for the remaining channels. Now this input mixer looks really simple, but it's very powerful. It can be used to combine right and left channels into a mono subwoofer output, for example. You can also use it to sum inputs. If you have a factory that has like a two-way system with a tweeter and a mid-range, and there's a crossover in the amplifier, you can just use the DSP's high-level inputs. You can put the left tweeter on input 1 and the left mid-range on input 3, and then you can output a full-range signal on any of the eight channels. I'm going to use outputs 1 through 6 for the front speakers and then use channels 7 and 8 for the rear speakers. Now the subwoofer, the RCA is going to run right to the amplifier from the head unit and I'm going to bypass the DSP for the subwoofer. And I'm doing this because my head unit has a built-in subwoofer control that I want to keep using. And the thing to remember is I can always change that. It's just a matter of moving some RCAs around and rerouting the mixer inside of the DSP. And I can come in and make those changes anytime that I want. The next thing I'm going to do is set the time delay. Now the time delay is really good for making sure you have great stereo imaging and a great center channel image centered on the driver's seat. Now this DSP has multiple presets so you can set one where the passenger seat has the right time delay. Lots of things you can do here. You start by hitting the delay icon in the lower left. Then you can enter the delay in milliseconds, centimeters, or inches. According to information that I found on the DIY mobile audio forums, there is a glitch in this software. So the users on that forum recommend just using the millisecond setting and they provided links to a website that can be used to convert uh, inches to milliseconds. You'll notice that channel 2 has no delay. That is the right front tweeter. That speaker is the furthest away from the headrest so it gets no delay and the remaining speakers are all delayed relative to that particular position. Next, I'm going to set the crossovers. Now, I can change these anytime I want. So for now, I'm just going to pick some frequencies that seem about right to me. It's a little bit tedious. I've got to go through all eight channels and set the crossovers individually. The DSP has a link function, but that function seems to only control the volume of the linked channels. I'm going to put the tweeters at 7000 hertz, and I'm going to use 24 decibels per octave slopes. One interesting glitch, if I run the slider all the way to the right, it stops short of the 20 kilohertz point. And that's a little bit annoying, so you've got to go in and type 20,000 every time you want to set a 20 kilohertz crossover frequency. Um, the mids are going to be 1500 up to 7000. The mid bases are going to go uh, 60 up to 1500. And it's just a matter of going through and being very thorough and making sure you click every single one of them and double checking your work to make sure you don't miss any. And at this point, everything is kind of basically set up. And this is a really good spot to set the DSP aside 
and start working on the gains to make sure all the gains are set up right. Before setting the gains, always unhook the speaker outputs on the amplifiers. I'm just going to show you the process for the mids and highs. The process for the subs is exactly the same. You're just going to use a different test signal. In addition to setting the gains on the amps, it's also important to check every component in the signal chain for clipping. Now I tested the head unit ages ago and it doesn't clip. It's a really good head unit. Now I've got to check the DSP because it's a new component in the signal chain. In order to make it easier to test the RCA outputs from the DSP, I just picked up these RCA to speaker adapters and then crimped on some crimp connectors. Now you don't have to do this, but it makes it a whole lot easier to connect the probes from the scope because they just stay in when you connect them. I use the Lumi LM2001 to set my gain. Now this is a cheap and effective way to set gains, but there are some drawbacks. The display is very hard to see. It's not auto ranging. Now there is a new version of the device that is auto ranging and has a higher contrast screen. I'm just gonna play a 1000 Hertz test tone that I downloaded from the Kicker's website. It takes a few minutes tinkering with the settings before you can really get a good look at the sine wave. The tops at first look a little bit flat, which would indicate soft clipping, but this is just a problem with the display resolution of the scope. So I pulled up a screenshot of the DSP and I've got the camera on the Lumi here. And I've temporarily disabled the crossovers in the DSP and we're gonna go in and check the gains and see when this thing clips. So let's start sliding up the main volume control on the DSP and watch what happens on the scope. Pay close attention to the voltage in addition to the sine wave. The scope is not auto ranging, so when you hit two volts, you get an error message and you have to go switch the dial to the 20 volt setting. When that happens, you've got to go back and tinker with the display settings so you can get a good look at the sine wave. This scope has a backlight that makes it easier to read the display, but the backlight times out after about a minute or so, and you have to hit the power button to turn it back on, which is extremely frustrating. So now that we've got the scope set up where we can actually see what's going on again, we start cranking up the volume. Now what I want you to notice on the DSP is that the main volume has already turned a very light red color, and as we crank it up, it gets a darker red. Synchronizing the two videos is a bit of a challenge. It appears this thing starts to go into a soft clip at 56. By the time you get up to 60, you've got a nasty flat sine wave. So let's back this thing down and I think setting it at about 55 as our maximum volume on the DSP is probably safe. This gives us 2.45 volts, so that rounds up to two and a half volts, which I think is the specification on the digital signal processor. And this shows one of the downsides to this particular digital signal processor. It would be really nice if it had four volt outputs, but it's a very functional processor and it's a very affordable processor. So that's just part of the trade-off. If you want a top of the line processor with four volt outputs, you're gonna have to pay more. Now it's time to set the gains on the amplifier. The process is mostly the same, and I'm not gonna show you all eight channels of amplification and the gains for all of them, but you do have to go through all of them if you wanna make sure everything is just right. One thing to keep in mind with these amplifiers, they don't use any kind of a screw to hold down the speaker wires. Typically when I'm setting gains, I use that screw to hold the probes in place. But these have uh, Molex style plugs, and so uh, you need a friend to hold the probes for you while you adjust the gain with a screwdriver. One thing I noticed while setting up this system, if you clip these amps, especially if you clip them very hard, they're going to emit a very high pitched tone, which is a great way to verify that they're clipping. And I wanted to show you this. I've never seen this before. When the gain's cranked up too high, you get this really ugly, jagged sine wave. I wonder if that's correlated with the high pitch whine that comes from the amplifier. So since I've already got a basic crossover layout in the digital signal processor, I went ahead and just grabbed my polarity checker. Now these things are dirt cheap. They're less than $15 online. And the first time I saw one being used, I thought, what a waste of money. There's no way that I would ever flip the polarity on a speaker or something like that. And well, I was wrong about that. This right here is some of the best money you can spend if you're trying to do audio on your own without any help. 
So we're going to pop over to some footage where I went around and I shut off channels individually in the digital signal processor and check the polarity on everything in the vehicle and let's take a look at what we've got. So now we know what the problem is. So we're going to pop over into the DSP software and we're going to start going in and we're going to start flipping the polarity on anything that was off. And the first thing that I noticed when I was doing this, I was playing music while I was doing it, and the instant I flipped the polarity on the door speakers, everything changed. It went from a flat, dull, dead sound, disappointing to, wow, hey, that sounds pretty good. And it made a world of difference just swapping the polarity on that one speaker that was off. So far, I've just scratched the surface on what I can do with this digital signal processor. It sounds absolutely amazing, and I haven't even touched the equalizers. If you want to see more on what this thing can do, let me know by hitting the subscribe button, hitting the like button, and let me know down in the comments if you want to see more of the functionality of this digital signal processor. If you enjoyed this video, here are some others that you might enjoy as well. I'm the DIY Audio Guy, and I'll see you on my next adventure.